one second. Um, welcome in the meantime. I want to do a talk for you about security hardening, configuration policy, and also a few things about optimizing, let's say, virtual machine job thing, something like this. Um, okay, and Nicolas. <laughs> uh, okay. I think we can start. Welcome. Um, so, cross OS security hardening. What do I mean? I mean, I want to have a security policy that looks pretty much the same on multiple operating systems that has a unified way of being applied and that also is easy to adapt and well documented. <coughs> the background of this is a hardening project uh, that we did two years back, I think, and my thoughts while doing that project and also the follow-ups from it. I was looking for a pretty quote to start this. I found this um, from the Equifax breach two years ago. Um, I only want to talk about one part of this. So honestly, they had 48 hours as the internal deadline for patching. They weren't slow patching or something. Um, their problem was just one word in this thing, it's legacy. So they had defined in their mind the Solaris environment that we've been using for 20 years. It's a legacy thing and it's really hard and we're a little bit afraid that the Solaris admins are going to go and retire at some point and then we're going to have a much worse security issue. We need, we need to migrate off that. And yeah, we don't know what to do. So honestly, maybe I get promoted by then and it's the problem of the next manager. Maybe there's another solution or we just keep doing this slowly. Uh, in 2015, I think they had an audit report that said, we have problems rolling out patches on time and we have a lot of problems with this old ACIS system which runs on Solaris, the legacy environment. So as a Unix guy, I don't know, I've been, I think I started with Linux in 1996, I didn't understand anything. Then around 99, I started understanding things and then I went into commercial Unix, then into Linux. And one thing I noticed with Unix is it's always pretty much the same. It has a basic concept. So if some management guys tell me, yeah, this is our legacy environment, I'm gonna think, wait, you don't know that this is pretty much the same always and it works the same and it's the same commands in most of the things. How is it legacy? If a developer tells me, yeah, we cannot do anything there that's legacy, I'm also gonna think, wait, so Apache struts, so some web applications have something with Java, I guess. Well, Java runs everywhere. So why do you have to patch the Solaris system? Why can't you put a web server in front of that? Why, why can't you do anything? And then of course you come to the point where you see, well actually legacy just means I don't want to deal with this because someone else did it and I'm hoping that I get away and someone else will do it. Uh, I fully understand that. The thing is, uh, it doesn't work. We need to have security standards and if we make it a bit easier to have the same standards everywhere, we might free enough time and also include these legacy systems in the mindset of the security policy makers. Um, and in this talk I want to show a bit about what we could do for that maybe. And then there is the smaller places like Equipot right now. I think they're good at security by now because the whole system is already like it was already hacked so they know that one well and they also are pretty afraid right now for the other stuff so I think they're not the main target at the moment where we have to improve things but the question is how can we bring hardening, hardening experiences we do for bigger systems to small ones like the ones that have 10, 20, 30 servers or let's say 500, they will not get the budget to do the same security preparations as a place with tens of thousands of systems. They will not have the in-house expertise, they will not have the processes, and especially, probably they will not have 
the ability to, uh, ability to do it a few times in a row, like each year or something. So what I think we could do, and that's a configuration management topic, is to drive down the costs of doing a hardening for systems. So focus more on things that will apply to many systems, <coughs> make them flexible enough to express the little differences. So, I don't know, this Solaris box has a special setting. Okay, I can just put an exception in this place, or at this one, or I can try to make my policy so it easily accepts those things. It's going to be a bit harder in the start, but hopefully it's going to help. Um, I can offer flexibility to, for example, express that one team needs this security standard, this other one needs that security standard, and I should keep track of that. And I definitely need to lower fears. So the, the typical thing that happens is you harden the system a bit, put some security, something doesn't work, uh, let's say there is a bad update coming with you. You easily find somebody who's going to turn on the, uh, turn off the automatic patching. You might even document that because they need a safe way out. But you're not going to find the person who, after debugging and finding that it was a completely different issue, is going to turn on the automatic patching again after they've finished. And that's because fears, they're a bit afraid. So we need to not just make a hardening policy that locks down systems, but we need to make one that people feel safe with. And that's a bit tricky. Um, when we were preparing for this, certain Linux operating system hardening. Um, we were going through all the applicable guides we could find. Um, the CIS is the Center for Internet Security or something. They're pretty practical. BSI has a government job and uh, like serves many people or many customers and goes pretty deeply. Then there's the DOD, which is probably the most standard thing. There was a few, for example, for Ubuntu from the UK government. I couldn't find them anymore the last time I searched. Uh, there's the PCI stuff for billing. And of course, the vendors also make their own guides. And they might also make PCI guides. And then there's basic things you would find on the internet that are not covered in those. So basically, you have like seven, ten data sources. And <clears throat> you want to make something out of those. Um, when I started, I was just doing a best friend host to FreeBSD. Pretty simple, you follow certain rules. Uh, you set flags that, I don't know, log files cannot be overwritten by users, uh, but only appended to, just the basic stuff that you play with or something. And after that, I didn't do a lot in that area. But a few years later, we had a funny incident where, well, it wasn't funny for the person like that. They were trying to do the right thing and to harden their systems, and they didn't understand that the playbook set they were using was not meant for the OS they were working on. So they had the desire to secure the system as a developer. They had the time to do it. They put up, like, they asked for the resources to do it, and they ran something and thought, okay, it's going to be secure. It didn't work anymore afterwards, and that's also something we end up sometimes doing when we secure systems too much. Um, but in the end, I feel pretty sad for them because they were doing the right thing. Um, then there was some cloud hardening stuff, uh, which was interesting because if you do normal security scanners, they will tell you you should, I don't know, install antivirus or a rootkit detection. And then you look into root uh, rootkit detections and you find like RK Hunter, CHK rootkit, stuff I know from the 90s. and pretty obviously that stuff is not current anymore. And it took me like a few days to find out there's something called maldetect that also plugs into FamilyV and is actually current. But you will not find that in any documentation because, yeah, the documentation, I guess it just gets copy-pasted. Uh, copy and then uh, where's the point where we were actually writing a guide? <coughs> After that was finished, um, was doing, uh, working pretty well, I was asking myself, can I just have one policy and make this work on all systems? So of course there's the obvious cases that the SSH daemon is going to have different names or something like that, 
But ignoring that, there's not much left. You might have big differences, like the one OS has as a Linux, the other one has App Armor or something. Uh, but that's not so such hard a requirement to, to not be able to express that. Um, so this is the feedback from uh, when we did the original Hadamin project. Lots and lots of detail work. This is basically about the whole number of guides. So each security guide you're going to find is, has like 100, 150 controls for operating systems, which is single settings. And of course they're not the same, so you need to kind of know, okay, I'm setting this one, and it covers the requirements from three of those guides, and that thing is going to come from that guide, and this is coming from my brain because it's obvious and it's not in the guide. And this checklist-based security thing is something we always read grants about. It's something, of course, we want to avoid that. We want to have a policy that actually brings security. So, I have just one example. You get a list of kernel modules that you're supposed to block, like free VXF, S, uh, JFFS2 and something. Uh, but nobody tells you you should block RDNA, you should not allow GRE tunnels in your servers unless they have the need for that. So basically you run through that guide, you don't do any hardening on the things that would, for example, protect you from getting data stolen, but you're gonna finish the guide. And when you are creating a policy, or instructions for people, you need to like get in the middle of this. You need to get all the good input from the existing ones and then also add your things. And what I completely did not expect was that there would be mistakes in them, like settings that don't even work for the OS or something, but they copy paste and you have to deal with that. When picking up on the old policy and adjusting it for newer operating systems, um, I ran into basically time. It was just one year and I saw a lot of drift already, things that had changed. Uh, good things like very old OS that weren't relevant anymore, but also just weird things. Um, and one thing I was still hunting and trying to figure out was what I mean by secure levels. I wanted to be flexible enough to say, so this is a web server, it's going to be a bit higher on the level of security. This one is the system with my CA, it's going to have the highest level. And this is a normal one, it will just have a baseline. And I wanted to configure that easily. And maybe not go back down to a more insecure level, but at least to be able to raise it and not have an initial decision when the system is built or something. And then I had the question, so what do I do about operating systems that are not supported by my configuration management solution? Because there was some. So our company core, Tier zero OS is like hardened BSD and Alpine Linux. Those are both not uh, um, supported in product. But of course they work with Ansible, so I had to think, okay, how do I make a policy that looks the same in two different tools? Um, for the very practical thing, if you want to make some hardening policy for yourself, um, I think the most important thing for me was to switch to Jinja templates only because they work in most systems, so you can have a template that is just the same for Ansible, for Rudder, and so on. You might to have to do some mapping to change variable names so they match or something, but basically once you stick with Jinja, you're going to have an easier life. Uh, SysTTL is a crazy thing. Um, you used to have a sysTTL.conf, you put a setting there, it's done. You can monitor that the setting stays the same as you have in a config file, so your policy is upheld. But these days, you have dynamic loading for them, they can also be applied from system D side, and you suddenly need to introduce order and to define, okay, so if it has that number, it's been set by an application team, and this one comes from the security guy, so it has always to win, and then you have to monitor that. It gets a bit tricky, and Really, you need to find out where your settings come from. So it's not enough to keep documentation on that. In some point, you just have to trace it back, really. And, and you need to have that in your file names and everywhere. Um, what I mean by be proactive so you can stay nice. Uh, little story, you have these requirements that uh, you need to be automatically locked out after 600 seconds or something of not working in a root shell. Yeah. <clears throat> 
what we did was we said, okay, so for root, we need that, but for a normal user shell, it will be it will stop. So maybe we can make it so that after two hours or something, screen just automatically logs. And maybe we can put it so that if your root shell is in a screen, we also don't do something to it. Could be possible. And with that, we had a good solution. I was in a different place a bit later, and suddenly I get logged out from my user shell. And I ask, oh, why are you doing that? Yeah, there was a security audit, and we had to put that in. And that's the thing, if you already put up a good level of security from the start, but with a high level of convenience, you're probably gonna be in the situation that you can keep the settings that you put for your users, and you don't have to take the defaults that the auditor gives you. Because the auditor, they're gonna take the line from their list and give it to you. If you didn't before that already think about another line, you're gonna have to, uh, um, you're gonna have to use theirs. So, that's why I really recommend to identify the areas where you can put defaults that are user-friendly. And finally, if you use templates in, especially in multiple systems, but also if you have a lot of different operating systems covered by the same template, uh, you need to be very careful with like if-then-else definitions. You need to know what happens if it goes into your else path, and you need to have one. Otherwise, you will end up with really weird and broken configs. Um, otherwise, the things I would recommend you to look at when you hardware your systems that are not always in the guides, or just nobody talks about them much, um, Linux kernel namespaces, you have like things like anonymous temp, so somebody can just put files that you, as a sysadmin, will not easily see. Uh, you will usually not find recommendations for hardening dev SHM, which is really, it's most often it's world writable, and it's where any stupid web rootkits downloads their stuff. Uh, look at kernel modules that have networking capabilities or something like that, and get rid of them if you don't need them. It's not too hard if you actually define what your systems are gonna do. And this half get thing is like often recommended for VMs. You will also find guides that force you to turn it off. So I'm not gonna give an opinion on that. I just, my lesson was you need to discuss it. You need to think, is it on or off? And maybe the system that is, does your certificates, that is the super critical one, uh, critical one you will have it off. Um, also, yeah, I don't know why, but quite a few systems, if you install them, they're just gonna have like really tiny host keys, and if you find a very mature organization, they already have a process to just go to APC SSH and rebuild them all with 4K. Uh, you will also find OS that like make it a bit hard to do that because features or something. Uh, I would recommend that you have policies that turn off certain IP tables modules. For example, if it's not a Docker host, you don't need masquerading. Uh, which means that you take away one way of pivoting through your network, because I don't need to have connectivity to the other system, I can use NAT. And it's really helpful if you take away these things, you're gonna piss off people a lot. Um, I had kernel modules somewhere here. Oh yeah, the first one. This is here for two reasons. First reason was the thing that I just said with RDMA and stuff like that. But if you remember um, the Yahoo case, where they found that the FBI had had them install software to like copy all the emails going through them, there was kernel modules. This, the Yahoo security team found them independently. They didn't know about this thing, so they were raising the flags, and that's how it got public. Um, you should at least consider this kind of stuff. Um, my, my best takeaway was audit key. Uh, first of all, compared to 15 years ago, it doesn't lose, um, doesn't lose messages anymore when it uh, log rotates or something. And it's really quite cl uh, cross-platform. You can have a simple policy that works on, yeah, even down to Alpine Linux or something. Which means you can use this to detect things like somebody modifying the kernel modules. Very helpful. Um, the worst things 
I saw with the guides or with just what software is right now. Um, there is, as far as I know, only one operating system where the KXEC binary and all the stuff it does are properly signed. <laughs> That's Fedora. Anywhere else, KXEC these days is a really nice attack vector to just put you a different kernel, then maybe have a reason to crash your system and load something you will never ever see. And that's another case for Audity, because then at least you're gonna see if somebody runs that thing to load your different kernel. Uh, then there's USB security. There is currently two projects. One comes from the Red Hat space, one from the SUSE space. The Red Hat one, let's say, is feature limited. And the SUSE one has a, I don't know anymore, it wasn't SourceForge, but something like that, a page there. And it says from the developer, you're not gonna understand this, so don't download it. And that's it. Um, but it would have been nice, like it's a blacklisting, filtering, USB firewall thing, and you could say, okay, on my systems I want to allow a keyboard and a mouse. There will never be mouse storage. Please, even if the device first says it's a keyboard and then says I'm a mouse storage, just throw it out. Technically possible, but not applicable at the moment. Um, there's a paper about root, de root kit detection with OSSEC. I have a link in there in the presentation. The paper basically says it doesn't work. I was a bit surprised, it was seven pages or something, and in the, in the end I was sitting there and thinking, why did I just read this? Um, you can catch some stuff again with Audity, but at the current state of the art, since GRSEC is not available anymore or something, you, you we always have little weak points on the kernel side, then most guides recommend tools like a tripwire and, and also OSIG for scanning the system for malicious modifications. But the idea of the security guys there is you run this once a day and you, then you have the hashes of all files. So if I, uh, let's say in one minute, replace your SSH team and restart it and then put back the old one, they're not gonna catch it. I don't know why they think they even should spend the letters to put that in their autos. Um, the good thing is OSSEC can run with iNotify. Um, the thing is, or the trick is, you have to watch a directory for the contents. If you put a file under watch, it's not going to use iNotify. And basically that's the only way that I know or that I found. Um, if you would like to notice if somebody just quickly in flight modifies your system. And then about the hardening process itself. So if you start working on something like this, um, very important. You might have uh, your policy in, um, in the configuration management. You might have inspect checks that you wrote. Please also use something else. So we uh, always use, uh, use Lunis, which is a really simple online scanner. And the trick is, I want to know my baseline. And I'm, if I'm the person that is defining the security standard, I should not trust myself. I, I'm gonna miss things. So for, this, uh, for the finding out like what is the security level of the system, we used a different tool where we actually didn't even configure much or something. We were just checking, okay, is our config getting more safe? Is it going up? Did we break something yet? Is it inconvenient yet? And so we slowly moved up from yeah, let's say they, they, they give you a score for a system. You should take a basic OS install. It's going to be the 60 out of 100 points or something. And you can go to 85 and it's still going to be usable. And then comes the point where at some point it gets really annoying to use your system like at 95 or something. But it's really simple and it gives you an independent oversight of, uh, of uh, over what you do. Um, while you're improving your policy, let's say in a testbed or something, you should run the policy basically constantly, so you don't waste time. So if you can put a cron job that just fires it every minute or something, that's the right speed. Um, and the last one, you need an index document. I'm gonna go back to the pretty picture. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, imagine these are all our security guides. We get controls from all of them, we have our own ideas. If we don't write down what our idea was and why we had it, 
and which operating system version it was meant for, we're going to five years later sit there and think, yeah, that was because something with security. I'm not going to know why. And basically what you need is a document that has this file gets modified on basis of these four guides. In those it's the controls 1, 2, 3, A, B, C and E, F or something. You need to be able to track that because when you introduce the next operating system version then you can see, okay, we made a comment this is version specific or we didn't. So you can actually skip forward or backward and you don't um, waste all your time trying to find out which measures you need again. And the bad thing is we didn't do that. I had wrote it down in the start, but nobody understood me, I guess. I hope you understand <coughs> a bit more now. The thing is, if you don't make this documentation and don't track what security settings you do and why you do them, in the end it's going to cost you tens of thousands of euro. Just the next time, you're going to have more effort. A few more times later, you're not going to be able to trace back anything. And especially since there's little stupid cases like, oh, this CTL is now a part of the base OS. It's automatically correct. Do I take it out? Do I stop watching it? What if then, like not so long ago, some software modifies that CTL? And you thought, yeah, okay, this is like a security issue from 2009, nobody cares about it, the basic Linux default is all right. And then you find out, oh, the other system is not running that anymore. If you don't have documentation where you can look up why you did stuff, uh, you lost. For being effic uh, effective with building a policy, um, like in cooking, prepare all your stuff in fr uh, at front. So you, uh, you can lar uh, launch a large number of VMs, um, just start modifying them, running your policy over them one by one, and basically you do that until your services work, until you have actual security benefits, and then you can throw away the ones you didn't need. If you start doing this uh, with a normal uh, cloud-based tooling, and you spin up the first one, you run your security policy, you record the result, you shut it down, you st start the second one, you're gonna take forever. You need to be like a factory speed for this. And that's why it's really important to use VMs that you just throw away after you did your first test. Uh, what we did was normally to log into Splunk, and we would, for example, set um, the the commit ID for the security policy as the host name, so we would have it in the log files. But there's a lot of ways what you can do for that. Okay, so now how did I continue like this? Um, the main problem was I really, really wanted to have this layered security, that I have an easy baseline, I can plug in some more security, I can add some more, and it should not have conflicts or anything. And that was a pretty tricky. Um, I knew I would have to formalize how we do the hardening stuff. Um, I knew I needed a test bed that can run all the operating systems I want to look at. And also that I needed to have a very easy to run test in there and, and to force myself to have more documentation. Um, what we did is uh, we used our standard of Nebula that we, that we have. Uh, I did a lot of Packer runs to build VM images and there's a thing called a service which means you can start an environment as a one group. Normally it's meant for start the database server, start a web server, start a proxy or something like that. But you can also just use it to say start every operating system I have. Um, it's mostly driven from GitLab but you will not see any of the GitLab parts now, because you will, yeah, there was some problems I'm going to tell you later. Um, the basic workflow that we have now is uh, GitLab has the, uh, the Packer templates for all the systems. The images get uploaded into our normal cloudy thing. Um, then we start running the policy from Rudder or Ansible. Uh, we use the check-in claim monitoring and Linux 
on the very right side uh, to actually check the security score we reached. And of course, I want to, in the end, just say if an image is produced that gives a lower score, it's going to be not a successful commit. I'm not there yet, but that's going to be the nicest thing, I think. And I also want to update the documentation and confluence from these builds. So we, like, we have a, a system. It could have a config file saying, yep, I was deployed with that version of the security policy, and then I have documentation that refers to that version of security policy. That means after the fact, even two, two or three years later, I can find out, okay, what was the basis for the system? What score did I have back then? Was it okay? Was it safe or not? Um, otherwise, we see a bit of the security policy here now. We see something set baseline, monitoring, and there's a few more pieces. There's OS maintenance, which for example, covers the automatic patching. Um, but you could still say that one part of that is disabled for certain systems. The baseline does the most important hardening stuff, and then you can plug more things on top of that. Um, I'm going to show that later. What else do we have? Uh, next. So, yeah, what went wrong when we were building this? Mostly really the thing about the note taking. I, I found if you don't do that on time, there's no way. There's no way you can recover it. Even if you do a second hardening run, you still won't know why did you have that the first time. Are you making the same decision? It's, yeah, so for the next OS we're gonna do it, but this one, I can make notes, I can make guesses, but the real full thing I'm never gonna have. Um, yeah, also just while preparing, suddenly Packer stopped respecting the QMO image size and started making images a lot larger or not working at all anymore, then there was one SUSE repo which is using a DSA key and of course that isn't, like if you're building a security policy, uh, then probably you have settings that won't accept that repo. In that repo was OSEC, so I was thinking, okay, so we're installing a security monitoring software that's probably like gonna run as root or something, and it's coming from a completely insecure repo. What am I even doing? And yeah, then my last fun was that at some point our software-defined storage just dissolved a bit, and then I didn't have to give that anymore because it was well, gone. Um, so you can estimate how long does it take to get this whole thing running. I'm not a like CI engineer or something, QA engineer. If you have someone like that, it's gonna be faster. Just to get the, the cloud under work building or running, it was like 50 runs or something. Let's say it's probably 10 minutes or so. Uh, then to have the books that automatically register systems and the configuration management, there wasn't so much documentation on that, so there's another 50. Um, GitLab itself was taking quite a lot of time and I wanted to have the GitLab CI in front of everything because that's the one who can check for me. Has the guy written documentation? If not, he's not going to have a Packer image in the end. Sorry. And I noticed that you definitely have to do uh, some tuning for Packer. So if you have systems with enough RAM that you can just build and convert the images in memory, that is really helpful. And also compression, just turn it down. You don't need like a maximum piece of compression for your VM images that you run in-house. Okay, um, otherwise, it's gone pretty well. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna show you. It's the easiest way. Just a second. So here we have, oh wait, oops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we have this thing called rudder. It's not as pretty. Um, and I have a few VMs running here. Just a moment. So these five, they decided to not really play with us, but it's okay. I launch normally two or three of the same type. Um, I found that you need one to see what you broke, or that you broke something. One way you can debug it, and one way you can test if the fix was okay. So 
three or four VMs per OS is basically enough. And, and we have here the normal spices. So there's Ubuntu, CentOS, SUSE, and so on. Um, for the FreeBSD side and the Alpine side, the gateway is running Ansible from within Rudder, but I'm not really far with that yet. Uh, I have documented in the slides the things I already did. So I have a proof of concept that maps the variables so they can have the same names in both tools, which means the templates can be the same. Um, it just needs the final polish, so I could say I show this. Uh, wait, security policy. No, that's one of that's the sorry. Okay, I'm gonna take this old CentOS VM, it's a bit more fragile than the other friends. And what I do here is I just set this one thing. Let's say I want a security level of one. Uh, one practically means I already want to have the baseline. Zero means only do monitoring, like run audit or something, scan a system sometimes. One means lock it down a bit. What does that mean? Oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> um, one moment. So here we see now the system is getting a lot more of policies. Uh, they're going to apply, and I think before I'm out of time, I can show them. But let's give it a, let's give it a second so it can actually run the agent and deploy everything. Um, if we open this. We will have a nice overview um, telling me the baseline is on the way. It's going to have the SSH hardening stuff. Uh, it's going to install all the packages it needs or uninstall the ones it shouldn't have. And it's also going to do all the kind of uh, module hardening stuff. And down here on the monitoring side, yeah, we get OSEC, uh, we get automatic scans with Linus, and the monitoring agent. So it's just a normal base policy. The thing is, I can simply with the security level uh, setting select how much of it I want. So if I have a developer who says, I cannot have this stuff on my machine, I need to test, I can make an exception for them, but then only by setting this one thing. So it's not complicated, it's really trivial. And that, I think, was worth the effort of fighting and, and trying and, and coming up with naming conventions and all that stuff. I'm going to go to the slides for one more second. Sorry? Just 10, minutes. 10 minutes? Left or? Yeah, left. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, that was my backup slide in case the demo doesn't work. Okay, I just said so. Um, in progress is the Ansible part. Um, if you go with this link, you will find how to automatically template a JSON file from Rudder, Rudder that contains all the, the, the namespaces and load that into Ansible. And of course, this is not a Rudder Ansible thing. This is a one configuration management system, other configuration management system. There is not. It's always going to work like that. And if you think about it one more step, then you can also just dump everything that you have in your one configuration system, somewhere in the system, so that local tools can use it, and you should. Mm, okay, skip that one, what's important? I, s I promised to say something about NSJ. Uh, it showed up like during the hardening. You have SA Linux, you have AppArmor, and you have basically NSJ. And it's the most simple thing I've seen. It works just on namespace basis, and the config file is like this long, so every developer can give you the config, and you are able to harden basically every normal service. So you can do hardening for cron jobs that talk from databases and, and this kind of stuff, which is really, really helpful. Um, summary, was it worth doing this? We still need a lot of time to build OS templates. We don't have unlimited resources. The operating system installers often are multi-threaded. It just takes time, but we at least get all the automatic updates for our base images. So, yes. We're able to deploy our policies everywhere, and we have 
better improved uh, quick starts and pre-seeds, so we can also go to the customers and give them the same OS image as we use, so yes, that's nice. Um, the real improvements are with avoiding regressions, because now I can just, if I want to change something in the classic SSH config, I launch this one service, have 20 VMs running, do my change, and Five minutes later, I'm going to see, okay, so I broke on this OS, everything else is fine, I fixed that one thing, I check once more, okay, all OS are fine, I'm done. So I have a, like a clear process how I do changes. I don't have to wait, I don't have to modify what I do, it's always the same way. Um, it also makes isolation much more easy, and it gives me the reuse, so I can use this for the next version of SUSE, the next version of FreeBSD. And yeah, finally, what was also worth it for me is getting a free CI, even if it's really annoying to deal with all these things that you have to run and run and run again. Um, and we have a baseline, so even if we find a place where we couldn't run our policy, we at least have the checklist ready. And we came up with some standards, so we have naming conventions now that weren't there before which means it's going to be much easier to match between two tools. Okay. So if I check this here again, then it's mostly done applying everything. Uh, let's have a look. Okay, it was the SSH restart probably because I had some, oh no, it's, it's basically it's fine, it was just putting in the ETC issue, and then the next run is going to be okay. <coughs> and where's my shell? Here. The shell is there, of course. So, okay, uh, in five minutes on Twitter, if you check, you should see a picture of the setting enabled for all systems and then the security level too. So you can see it's really quick to roll off. Just have it at SSH session and that's too annoying right now. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm really gonna post the screenshots. Normally I always forget to do my demos. It's something that happens. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna show. Okay, is there any questions? Sorry, sorry. Just speak loud, it's okay. I'm going to hear you. Uh, just a small remark about what you said before with the automatic uh, logout of the user. Uh, some, uh, some, compliance, uh, some compliance requirements have that explicitly in the text. Uh, for example, PCI DSS. Yep. Uh, So the comment was um, that in some standards it's definitely required to log out the user after a certain period of time. And my suggestion is still to, to check the fine print carefully because, okay. There's no wiggle room. Okay. It says you have to do that, and the client says you have to do that, you do that. Okay. <laughs> then we got lucky. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I hope it was interesting.